Well, alas, welcome to part four, the final part of our look at imperialism. Let's get into this one. So we actually have three chapters for you to take a look at uh, before moving on. They are shorter chapters and they each dwell a little bit on something different, but still with imperialism. And they're worth kind of chunking into all the same part. So bear with us. We're not going to break these into three separate parts. We're going to combine them into one. So that's why this becomes our last section to do. So go ahead and read about imperialism in China. Go ahead and read about imperialism in Japan. How you might think those would be similar stories, but they're actually completely opposite. And then finally about imperialism in South America um, and the Pacific. So go ahead, read those and come right back and we'll review. So here we are ready to review our three chapters here. Uh, let us begin with our look at China. So now China has been, has existed for centuries as an, an empire of various degrees through time. Through this, it had developed a largely self-sufficient um, kind of culture and society. It did not have interest then when given the option to trade with Europeans, to trade with Europeans for European goods. The thought was that, uh, you know, Chinese goods were better than the factory produced uh, European goods. So there was no interest. I mean, whatever Europe had to trade with China, China didn't need. Uh, but on the flip side, Europeans really did want what China produced, such as silk and spices, etc. So European with uh, trade in China was very restricted. And one of the ways it was restricted is that it was restricted to one port in Canton. And Europeans needed a way to expand and open up the trade with China because China was a vast market. It had more than the population of all of Europe. So it was, again, propelled by economic interest in their market. And so what they do is they begin smuggling or finding that one thing that Chinese actually wanted to trade for, and that was opium. And the British could do this because opium was produced in the British's India territory. And opium became that something, and British merchants began to smuggle it into China. Now, this is bad. This is an injustice. This is an abuse. This is an exploitation of trading uh, with a substance that is actually very um, consumable. It is addictive. It's an addictive narcotic derived from the poppy plant. So in effect, you're a drug trader, and you are creating a dependency in a population to desire a good that you have. Uh, and uh, exploiting their addiction to it. Okay, this is terrible. It makes it, it makes me sick to think that this is uh, something they thought was acceptable. But there you have it. So now you have the thing that Europeans can trade with uh, uh, Chinese people for, uh, and that the Chinese will return that trade. And so opium becomes the thing that's smuggled in. It uh, begins to weaken the Chinese government because the Chinese government could not stop this demand for opium uh, and the increase of European influence in China. All right. By 1800, China had over 30, 300 million people, more than the entire population of Europe. It was not an industrial nation, but it was self-sufficient, so had little interest in trading with Europeans. The Europeans were determined to find something the Chinese would trade for. And that sums up this slide, okay? Opium becomes a thing. Now, this is not the end of the story because as we see, there is um, uh, a deep problem with this that results in the Opium Wars, named after the issue <laughs> that they're warring over. There were two Opium Wars, 1839, uh, and then another in 1856. And um, let's talk a little bit about these. So as addiction, hang on a second, what do we got here? In uh, 1836, so prior to the Opium Wars, the Chinese appealed to Queen Victoria as a way to stop the opium, opium trade. And they said, so this is to the British Queen. Here's what they said. 
He said, suppose there were people from another country who carried opium for sale to England and seduced your people into buying and smoking it. Certainly your honorable ruler would deeply hate it and be bitterly aroused. In other words, be aroused to anger. And uh, of course, that is a scenario that would be true. I mean, if this was done to you, how would you feel? Okay, now the British disregard that mainly in the, in this for the sake of economic advantage. It's amazing what money can drive you to do. So, in time, this leads to wars, which were actually no match for the Chinese to win, despite their 300 million population. Okay, again, it's an imperial power, an industrialized power going against an unindustrialized power. As a result, the Treaty of Nanking is signed, and it totally under swipes the Chinese and benefits the British and gives British the advantage and opens up trade to all Europeans uh, in time. And the British begin to enjoy something called extraterritorial rights. And even after this, other European countries begin to set up spheres of influence in a weakening China and grabbing a chunk or share in the economy of China. Let's take a look at some of these terms. Treaty of Nanking uh, was signed, and what it does, it begins a first one of the first stages of European humiliation and uh, whatnot of ex exploitation of China, leaving it a sense of bitterness the Chinese would have against European people. Uh, so these this treaty resulted in the opening. Uh, of more ports to trade, as well as this concept of extraterritorial rights. Now, extraterritorial rights for the British meant it didn't require the British to follow Chinese law. Instead, they could follow British law. So you couldn't charge a British citizen uh, with breaking Chinese law on Chinese soil. Now, what does that mean? Well, in effect, it means that you can be lawless. You could be a criminal and not get charged because you're under the jurisdiction of British law on Chinese soil. Now, why would you say that? Well, British law should come after you then on China. Well, look how far away you are from Britain. Do you think Britain is actually enforcing British law in China on its British subjects? Uh, probably not. So it's extraterritorial rights essentially gives gives a free for all sort of sense to to, uh, you know, exemption from Brit uh, Chinese law, which is could be completely exploited and manipulated by the British subjects there or the European people present in China. You can't, you can't enforce Chinese law on a European. Um, okay, these ports that were open to trading, you know, were, uh, you know, the British were unable to enforce their own law on British subjects there. So a lot of lawlessness going and it kind of, again, I mean, it goes back to the opium wars. I mean, if you're basically drug smuggling, what kind of morals or what kind of standards or ethics do you have? All right. Secondly, is this concept of sphere of influence. These were areas that Europeans would lay claim to. So much like, um, I mean, much like, but completely different to the way Europeans chunked up Africa and actually laid military claim to. Um, they did the same thing to China, but only set up spheres of influence. So they weren't actually staking out territories and claiming them. They were staking out economic territories and claiming economic influence there, exclusive economic influence there. So it's different. You're not getting political territory, uh, physical territory, but you are getting an economic or a trade territory. And China is well big enough um, to have these areas chunked out, known as spheres of influence. Um, so they would benefit then the power and control of that specific territory. Um, and so in effect, it was it was one step less than physically laying claim to those boundaries or those um, territories like they did in Africa. But you can see that, you know, while Africa is being chunked up, um, China is uh, also sort of being divided up, except in an economic way, not necessarily a political geographical way. Hope that makes sense. OK, now all of this stuff begins to make the Chinese very angry. It fosters nationalism. 
the expression of various rebellions, like we see in the Taiping Rebellion in 1850 and 64, as well as the Boxer Rebellion, which you may have read about or watched, or we will watch a bit of a video about, uh, which happened in 1900. So the Chinese definitely are resentful of European actions um, in China at this time. So let's go ahead. And look and see what begins up ha begins happening now. By 1885, China they, things were getting heated, so that China was beginning to look like another scramble for Africa, uh, in competition of British, French, Japanese, Russian, and Germany claiming that influence of trade over territory there. And the United States kind of comes to the rescue because they also are invested in wanting con economic benefit from trading with China. Um, as you can see in the picture here, you got some of those nations depicted, um, America being there, Britain, obviously, Germany. Okay. China's like, whoa, hold on. Don't, ch don't cut us up like a big pizza. The United States is interested uh, in economic trade with China, but not necessarily gaining imperial control of territories in China, like, like what happened in Africa. And so they come and they propose the open door policy. It was proposed um, that uh, China have its door open to merchants of all nations. And this, and they said, so this is, this is something everybody agrees to except China. And uh, this was accepted by the imperial powers. And as a result, China was not physically colonized the same way it was in Africa because of the open door policy in 1899. Okay. Um, however, that doesn't mean that China wasn't under the influence of those European powers and under their mercy in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, the advantage of the open door policy for the United States is that they still were able to continue their trade with China. Now it's interesting here because at this point in history, um, all countries, all the industrialized countries are looking to trade with China because China is a great market. So goods are flowing into China in industrial manufactured goods are flowing into China from all parts of the world. Now look at today, it's the absolute opposite. China is like the hub of the export of manufactured goods to the rest of the world, okay? And we just we just, we just export uh, raw materials to China, okay? And they export finished products. So it completely flipped uh, in terms of ec economic um, trade today. Now, at the end of the day for China uh, is the fact that they're utterly humiliated um, over, you know, almost a century of trade with Europe there uh, um, uh, in this time of imperialism. And they're, they're utterly humiliated through treaty, uh, through, you know, wars they had lost through um, the influence of outside powers on their economy and their way of life and their culture and their emperor uh, dynasty and all this stuff. No doubt deeply rooted nationalism in China is stirring just like it did in every other country. Okay, this pride of being an independent country that is liberated of foreigners. I mean, that's what nationalism is. So nationalism's on the rise in, in uh, China as well. And uh, also this idea of, you know, a reform needed from that traditional way of life that Chinese had enjoyed for centuries. They needed political and economic reform. And movement was towards that. And so then they tried... Uh, you know, the, the Chinese uh, people, uh, people uh, Republic, the Chinese Republic, you tried that. And then today, uh, obviously, communism tried that as well. Um, you know, why, why wouldn't China rise against their European powers someday? And they had a history of being a powerful, you know, empire um, through, through centuries of uh, ancient Chinese history. They were a very, you know, at, at times, uh, a very interesting history, which we don't get a chance to study too much. But if you ever get to pinpoint on Chinese history, it's, or, you know, Asian history in general, it's really, really interesting. Okay, especially the influence of China and the status of their civilization at different times, way above that of Europe, Europe's lowest point. Okay. Um, to the point of today where you're like, okay, well, why is China, you know, such a powerful force in the world? Okay. Um, okay. Even the, even the question of why, why is China, you know, communist even to this day? 
Why is it? And it's a very dominant force in the world today. China has a lot of influence. Well, no doubt because of the fact you push somebody down long enough when they get up, better watch out, right? When they get a chance to swing at you, better watch out. So that's China in terms of uh, the uh, um, age of imperialism. Um, not quite as bad and chunked up like Africa, but certainly economically a uh, victim to European and um, American ambition and actually Japanese ambition. Let's go ahead and watch this and give you a bit, a bit of a summary of all this. It's kind of a montage or like a collection of different documentaries, but I think it's put together well. It gives you an idea of the Chinese struggle and their evolution. So push play. In the late 1700s, the British East India Company was eager to trade with China. So England sent a special envoy to the Forbidden City to negotiate a treaty with the Emperor to allow British traders free access to China. But the Emperor Qin Long refused to meet with the British representative, Lord McCartney, and sent a note refusing his request. Seven years later, Qin Long died. But the trade problem still existed. British demand for Chinese goods, porcelain, silk, and tea, increased. But the British were reluctant to trade silver for these goods. Finally, Britain found a commodity to trade with China without depleting her own resources. Opium, imported from India. When Chinese authorities tried to stop the opium trade, the British sent in their gunboats. A war ensued, and 20 years later, the Treaty of Tanjin in 1858 turned over China's ports and all of her international trade to Western control. The power of the Chinese dynasty had come to an end. Still, Imperial China pretended nothing was wrong. The Dowager Empress Su Shi organized a coup when the Emperor died and installed their six-year-old son as his successor. But the power behind the throne was all hers. Although life went on as usual in the Forbidden City, Riots erupted across the nation in the late 1800s. These riots were known as the Boxer Rebellion. As the 20th century opened, China was in turmoil. Corruption was widespread. Opium addiction was endemic. Rebellion, drought, and famine claimed the lives of 60 million Chinese. Foreign nations had divvied up the empire into spheres of influence. Areas where one country had exclusive rights to trade, invest and had special political rights. With a coaling base in the Philippines just 400 miles from China, American businesses hoped to take advantage of China's vast resources and sell to her vast market. John Hay, then U.S. Secretary of State, had a brilliant idea. He sent letters to all the foreign powers suggesting an open-door policy in China. This policy would help U.S. businesses by guaranteeing equal trading rights for all, preventing one nation from discriminating against another. At the same time, the open-door policy maintained the territorial integrity of China, an idea that appealed to anti-imperialists at home. Other powers politely put Hay off, saying that while an open-door policy is a good idea in principle, they had no way of enforcing it. However, Hay, despite the debate, boldly announced that everyone had agreed to the policy. Everyone, that is, except China. Su Si, Empress Dowager of the Qing Dynasty, was eager to rid her empire of these foreigners. In northern Shandong province, a secret society known as the Fists of Righteous Harmony attracted thousands of followers. 
They, too, wanted to rid China of foreign influences. But they also sought to throw off the yoke of the corrupt Chinese government. Foreigners called members of this society boxers because they practiced martial arts. Boxers believed that through meditation and discipline, they could cloak themselves in a mystical shield so foreign bullets could not harm them. The Empress welcomed the boxers as China's defenders and turned their fury squarely against the foreign community. In June 1900, the boxers began their bloody campaign. They murdered hundreds of foreign missionaries and Chinese Christian converts, destroying millions of dollars worth of property. About 900 foreigners blockaded themselves in their embassies for nearly two months, repelling waves of boxers. Ammunition, food, and medical supplies were almost gone. Then shortly before dawn, loud explosions rocked the city. Weary defenders staggered to the barricades expecting a final, overpowering boxer attack. But instead, relief had arrived. Troops from Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and the U.S. fought their way into Peking to free their countrymen and put down the rebellion. The boxers, believing they were impervious to bullets, were cut down by the thousands. The rebellion produced a bloodbath. Troops from Europe arrived in force. The imperial family fled the forbidden city, and soldiers entered its gates. For the first time, outsiders stood, uninvited, at the dragon throne. It was the beginning of the end of Chinese dynastic rule. In 1911, China became the Republic of China. In 1949, the People's Republic of China was founded. The days of glory for the imperial family were over, once and for all. There, so I hope you enjoyed that little look there um, at the Boxer Rebellion and stuff like that. The, the, the imperial the industrialized firepower and force and i think it's so interesting how that boxer rebellion even that european nations come together with a common goal of like overtaking the chinese because all europeans have an interest in the vast market that china is for them so they all have something to benefit so they come together and fight actually together unified and take out um, uh, China. Crazy. Okay. Let's take a look at Japan. Japan, as you know, is right here in the world. I think Japan's story is extremely interesting. Um, in 1850, Japan was exactly like it had been in the 1600s uh, under Shogun rule. Um, during this time, only Nagasaki was open to trade and only with European Dutch. So the only European connection that Japan had was through the Dutch. And so it's not like you could, they had English translators or French or German translators. Uh, they had Dutch connections with the Dutch language. You would translate with Japanese people through Dutch. Um, otherwise, all other contacts with Europeans were shunned. And But they, they soon found that their awesome samurai, as awesome as they were, uh, were no match for modern armies. And Japan, instead of closing itself in, um, and by the way, their economic policy of, of limiting to Dutch trade saved them from the opium situation that China had experienced. Otherwise, what happened in China might have very well have happened in Japan. Okay, So while China, in fact, is keeping fighting to keep its traditional way of life, Japan is choosing... A different course. It is seeing that the course of industrialization is the path to choose in order to not be overwhelmed by European powers. Okay, their technologies uh, and their ways of uh, living society should be studied and embraced where possible, so that uh, Japan would not be at the mercy 
of those powers. So it's a completely different look. While China's trying to keep tradition, Japan is looking to revolutionize. Okay, here's your samurai. I think the samurai are cool. There's a lot of neat things about Japanese culture um, as well. And Japanese dynasties. So the story of Japan is quite a bit different. And here's what is so influential in this. And that is, in 1853, American Commodore Matthew Perry, so an American trading diplomat, arrives with these huge steam warships demanding trade. Industrially disadvantaged, the Japanese had to open their doors or be conquered. They realized, you know, it took some time to think about this, but they realized that their traditional way of life is no match for what's happening in their outside world. As closed as they tried to make themselves for centuries to global trade and, and global influence, what they're realizing is that what, whatever's happening out there uh, in America, in Europe, okay, is, uh, is expanding technologically way beyond what they are doing and that something has to change, okay? So this challenges the Japanese to pursue industrialization. <coughs> which they do. And by 1900, we're looking like 50 years later, by 1900, Japan was as modern as any country in the world with a modern Navy modeled after the best. So they had a chance to go and study the best. So they modeled their Navy after the British with, their, with the modern army modeled after the best, the Germans with uh, uh, an economy, economy based on uh, industrial economy. And they even became an imperial power in China. So they were at the table to, uh, you know, to accept the open door policy to, to trade their manufactured goods with the markets in China. Okay. Even going and trying to conquer certain areas around um, the Pacific, as we'll see a little bit later. So Japan moves from becoming almost imperialized by European countries to one that becomes an imperializer, takes and uh, becomes an imperial power. Okay, I find that amazing how in 50 years, Japan can have the resilience to rise to match any modern industri industrial power or European power or even America. Okay, so that by the time of um, certainly World War II, Japan is in a place, you know, in the Pacific to be a global dominating military power. Okay, I mean, we look at its history of of industrialization and how it happens so fast. Okay. Now, why does Japan uh, work so hard to industrialize? Well, it's because with, with opening their, you know, they were forced by, by the sheer technology and military power of, of American Commodore Matthew Perry to open their doors to trade, which they had to sign away many concessions um, including things like extraterritorial rights to foreign traders and different treaties that disadvantaged them economically, uh, like it had in China. But in the meantime, they went about rapid industrialization uh, to a point that when they had an army that could match a European power, they would go to that country and say, okay, we want to renegotiate this treaty, which is... Um, disadvantaging us. So instead of going the route of rebellion um, only to fail like the boxers did, you know, thinking that you're impervious to bullets, um, they took a much more logical route or sneaky route or technological route and got to a point where they were bigger than their, uh, than those who had put them down before. So it's almost like, you know, you get beat up by somebody. And so you let that slide. They're allowed to beat you up. And in the meantime, you go and work out and get bigger and, I don't know, hone your skill so that when you can outmatch them, you go and renegotiate the, the, the terms of the treaty. And that is, you can't beat me up anymore. And Japan, that's what Japan does. So they go and outperform uh, or match, level up to the people who had, who had exploited them through those various trading partnerships and treaties and whatever, so that uh, Japan wasn't over um, exploited anymore. I like that. And they go and they, they study the best and that's what they adopt. They learn and that's what they adopt. 
um, they end their, their feudal culture, they end their, const uh, sorry, they adopt the constitution, etc. They build railroad network, they mine coal, they build factories. Um, and even to this day, you know, Japan has looked, I mean, it's declining quite a bit now, but looked to as a leader in innovation, technology, um, and all that. So amazing. Here's a documentary on Matthew Perry. So we'll enjoy this one as well. I think it's well put together and gives you an idea of the significance of one man on one event uh, and how it influences Japan like irreversibly. I think that's really neat about history is when you can pinpoint something as being so important and Matthew Perry being that. Commodore Matthew C. Perry, the man who unlocked Japan. By the mid-19th century, Japan was nearing the end of its Edo period, also known as the Time of Great Peace. The ruling regime, the Tokugawa Shogunate, was at the head of a feudal system which had stabilized Japan for over 200 years. In 1635, the passage of the seclusion laws had virtually removed Japan from all foreign influences. However, the arrival of the Commodore Matthew C. Perry in 1853 prompted the reversal of this isolationist policy. In the following time period, Japan experienced a technological revolution and boomed onto the world stage. Born on April 10, 1794 to a naval captain, it was only natural for Perry to pursue a career in the Navy himself. At the age of 17, he received a naval commission and rose through the ranks while serving on many vessels during the 1812 and Mexican-American Wars. During this time, Perry became one of the leading proponents of modernizing the United States Navy to include steam-powered ships. In 1837, he oversaw and took command of the Navy's second steamship, the USS Fulton. Eventually, Perry was dubbed the father of the steam navy. In the 1630s, almost 200 years before Perry's birth, Japan had enacted a foreign relations policy known as Sokoku, which literally translates as locked country. Under these laws, no European foreigner could enter Japan without being subjected to the death penalty. This radical policy was intended to shelter Japan and the power of its leader, the Shogun, from the religious and cultural influences of colonial powers such as Spain and Portugal. As time progressed, Sokoku also prevented the imperialist British Empire from forcing their way into Japan. The bloody scenes of the first opium war between China and Britain over trade disputes in the 1840s were never repeated in Japan thanks to the policy of Sokoku. However, this policy also caused Japan to be oblivious to the major scientific advances of the Industrial Revolution. Thus, even though Japan was largely conflict-free during this era, it was quickly becoming technologically inferior to the rest of the world. In 1852, Perry, now a Commodore, set his sights on securing a trade agreement with Japan, which was deemed by the West to be a closed country. Prior to selling to Japan, Perry studied books and even consulted with the Philip Franz von Siebold, who had lived near and studied Japan for over eight years. Now armed with maps which Siebold had provided, Perry sailed for Japan with a group of four ships, two of which were steam-powered and 560 men. Perry's goal was to be a peacemaker and to bring Japan into what he called the family of civilized nations. Ironically, the Commodore's embracement of steam technology posed a challenge when he arrived in the Japanese town of Shimoda on July 8, 1853. The Japanese villagers, never having seen a steam ship before, thought that the giant dragons puffing smoke were approaching and promptly raised an army of over 17,000 in order to defend themselves from the approaching threat. The reaction of the Japanese people can be reflected by one famous poem written after Perry's arrival. The steam-powered ships break the halcyon slumber of the Pacific. A mere four boats are enough to make us lose sleep at night. However, Perry never wished to disturb the Japanese people. His intention was to deliver a letter from President Fillmore to the Emperor asking for Japan's friendship and trade. On 
July 12th, the Japanese official Kayama insisted that Commodore Perry go to the port of Nagasaki in an attempt to put more distance between the powerful Americans and Japanese capital city of Edo, later to be known as Tokyo. Perry refused to leave and refused to deliver his letter to anyone but the Emperor himself. Unbeknownst to the Commodore, the Emperor of Japan during the Edo period was actually a powerless figurehead. The official who made all the important political decisions was known as the Shogun. Upon hearing of Commodore Perry's arrival, the Shogun at the time, named Ayoshi, fell ill and left his advisors to run the country. In order to make himself seem mysterious and powerful, Perry had his crew address him by the title of Admiral and withdrew into his ship's cabin. This ploy proved quite effective. His cabin came to be known by the Japanese as the abode of his high and mighty mysteriousness. After his fleet began to run out of provisions, Perry agreed to hand the letter over to the princesses of Izu and Iwami on the 14th of July. Three days later, Perry left for Hong Kong, with intentions of returning the next spring to hear the response of the Japanese. When he heard rumors that Russia was attempting to contact the Japanese, Perry decided to return prematurely on February 13, 1854 with nine ships and over 1,600 men. The Japanese, having been impressed with the American's technology, industry, and scientific accomplishments, agreed to help Perry to negotiate a treaty in Kanagawa. Negotiations were long and arduous, as all discussions had to be translated into Dutch before they could be translated into each party's native language. When the Japanese were reluctant to meet all the terms of Perry's proposal, he invited them to a ship for a feast, and gave the Japanese people gifts including guns, perfumes, a miniature train, a telegraph, and a steam engine. On March 31, 1854, thanks to much persistence from Commodore Perry, the Treaty of Kanagawa was signed, securing peace and friendship between the United States and Japan. Additionally, the ports of Shimoda and Hakodate were opened up to trade and Japan agreed to supply and assist U.S. ships which were in the area. The treaty caused much discontent in Japan, but proponents of isolation strongly opposed its enforcement. In 1866, an alliance between the Satsuma and Choshu domains challenged the power of the shogunate. The resulting internal strife was only quelled in 1868 with the following declaration by the Meiji Emperor. We shall henceforth exercise supreme authority in all the internal and external affairs of the country. Consequently, the title of emperor must be substituted for that of shogun, in which the treaties have been made. With the fall of the shogun during the so-called Meiji Restoration, the feudal system which had been the social structure of Japan for hundreds of years was effectively abolished. Japan was free to truly enter the age of technological revolution. Within five years, it had already acquired 26 of the Commodore's favorite vehicles, steamships. The Meiji Restoration and its consequences are generally held to be a direct response to the arrival of Perry and the removal of the Sokoku policy. Commodore Perry's legacy to the Japanese people can still be seen today. Japanese celebrate the anniversary of his arrival every July with the annual Black Ship Festivals. Additionally, a small museum has been constructed in Japan in order to commemorate the effects of Perry. Perhaps the greatest tribute to Perry's efforts can be seen in the city of Tokyo, formerly Edo, which has become a huge metropolis and one of the leading centers of technological innovation in the world. Its towering skyscrapers and bustling streets are a direct result of Commodore Matthew C. Perry, the man who opened up the portal to Japan. All right there, hope you enjoyed that. And now we're on to our last section, and that is the Americas. Okay, uh, a lot to go through here and to understand here. Now, just like we said, China could have been another Africa. We could also say South America could have been another Africa. These were territories that were, um, you know, that were former colonies, largely of Spain and Portugal, uh, left to their independence, but they were weak governments. They could have easily been overtaken by a uh, European power and recolonized and re-imperialized, just like what happened in Africa. 
Uh, the thing is, is that doesn't happen. And then so the question is, why doesn't it happen? Yet, how can we still see the spirit of imperialism present in the Americas? Okay. All right. Americas were, uh, Americans were quiet and largely focused on their own affairs on the world scene. We already see that in China, they're not interested in imperialism. Okay. Why would they be? And I think it's good. Um, they were once colonized. They were once part of an empire and split from that. So I think at least they're consistent in saying, no, we split from that. We side with the side of people who are under the power of a European. We don't want that. We don't want to be that person to somebody else. Now, interestingly, they do become that, as we'll see in a couple examples. Um, but what they are concerned with, so like they're not present in Africa, okay? And they don't chunk up, you know, uh, a sphere of influence in China. They propose an open door policy where everybody can trade. Um, but in the Americas, it's different. So they are deeply interested in maintaining security in Latin America and uh, in South America and preventing Europeans from taking these territories again as well. And there's this, and no, they justified their action to kind of preserve the independence and whatnot of the Latin Americas uh, because of the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, which states this, let me find it. Uh, the Mon Do Monroe Doctrine, which opposed European control influence or war in the Americas and preferred the independence of the different countries of the Americas. It states that the U.S. would defend the principle that the Americas, so North and South America, were closed to further colonization by Europeans. And so, again, something highly valued by uh, Americans is the separation and independence of those colonies from their colonizers, just like America had done. So the Monroe Doctrine was uh, America's upholding their own value of independence from colonial power. So in upholding the Monroe Doctrine into the late 1800s and early 1900s, America thought it had a role to preserve the independence of the nations in um, Central and South America. Now, granted, Americans are heavily investing in these regions on the resources present there. And so in secondarily, um, it is also a way to uh, preserve their investments if you don't let France and England and Germany capture parts of this uh, part of the world. Okay. So the Panama Canal is right there. And that's quite an interesting story. Um, Americans eventually take take over the construction initiative of the Panama Canal. Again, I think believe from a French company, which failed. So it's kind of a repetition of uh, the Suez Canal situation in Egypt uh, between the French and the English. Uh, now you have the Americans attempting and gaining control of Panama and, and getting that canal constructed which again is a trade route. So America has uh, influence in the Panama region at this time and the construction of the Panama Canal. And then all of these other countries, uh, Americans ultimately interfere with uh, to gain their own economic interest as well as to resist European um, a colonization or the liberation of these territories like such as Cuba, for instance, in the Spanish-American War which it happens at the end of the 1800s. Crazy how Spain is still present with its empire in the New World, uh, in the Americas, and America has to defeat, so the United States has to defeat the Spanish and grant independence to, like, Cuba, for instance. Okay? Um, let's see. So, through all of this, the Americans claim they haven't technically... They haven't colonized these territories of Latin America. They use this other word called intervention instead. So they intervene in these areas strongly, economically, uh, through their military power. They kind of persuade the rest of the world not to, not to, you know, uh, invade or to, you know, imperialize this part of the world. Americans are present to interfere with Latin American governments to their own economic advantage, as we saw with the story of Panama and inciting the revolt of the Pan Panamanians against the um, Colombians uh, so that they could then work with Panama to build the Panama Canal, for instance. 
finally finished in 1914, by the way. There's this growing idea, uh, the late 1800s, that the America, uh, that the United States of America has this job to kind of police and monitor and regulate um, the the Monroe Doctrine in all of North and South America. Uh, and their kind of duty to protect the Americas from further colonization and imperialism, uh, which is a good thing, okay? I guess, I mean, in the end, at the end of the day, it means that maybe less harms have been done here uh, in South and Central and South America. Okay, let's look at the Pacific Islands here. So uh, as shipping then expands into the Pacific uh, through the uh, 1800s into the 1900s, uh, European and Americans take great interest in controlling spe uh, specific Pacific islands and island groups in the region. It is a great big island to cross, okay? And so if you can have territory within the Pacific, then it gives you an uh, area to um, gain resources from. But it also, get away mouse, uh, gives you a docking kind of port station to repair and recall your ships for trading as well as your navies uh, for defending your trade routes. And so uh, the last the last um, kind of realm or ter area of uh, imperialism happens in the Pacific so that by 1900, nearly all these islands in the Pacific uh, are claimed by European powers as well as Japan as well as the United States. So you can see here um, British, French, uh, Dutch, German, American, Japanese, etc. are all claiming powers, uh, islands. That's how US obtains Hawaii, which is interesting because here is a good example of the United States becoming an imperial power and claiming a territory in the world that wasn't its own. Okay, now that's very strategic for the United States to have, as we know, by World War II, that's a very strategic military base point uh, with Pearl Harbor and all that. So go ahead and do your section review on chapter 25, chapter four, section four, six, five, and six. I also wanna say, you know, we looked at imperialism uh, through the late part of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s of global powers interfering and claiming uh, different territories in the world, uh, re redrawing maps and economic influence, and even inciting problems that we have that that have affected what we experience even today. So just look at Africa, okay? Uh, ex European imperialism in Africa divides up a country and kind of just messes it up. We see it even to this day with rivalries and, and um, economic disparity in, in, in Africa. Okay, look at China. Okay, China overrun at the mercy of European powers. It has a deep, deeply embedded resentment of European ways of living. Okay, and nowadays proving itself through domination of economic uh, and production and innovation. Okay, China is a powerhouse in the world today. No doubt that they have been inspired to do so because of their persecution in the past. We look at Japan. I think Japan's story and approach is just unique, how they decide very quickly to adopt European ways to imperialize and become a global power, even to this day. And the Americas, okay, how South America, still very weak part of the world, full of poverty and, and, and dysfunction, um, yet the only reason it's preserved and not, you know, not maybe more controlled by European powers is because of the Monroe Doctrine and the role of the United States to kind of protect that part of the world. Uh, and thirdly, no, I'm on fifth, sorry. Fifth is the Pacific and that last segment of imperial power, uh, European powers grabbing up islands in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, interesting look at history. The imperial power at play here. I wanna say that the rise of nationalism and imperialism uh, have direct influence on the occurrence of World War War, which would happen right around the corner here. And because it's inevitable, um, go ahead. And if you want to, to prep for uh, next year's studies, you can check out chapter 27.1, 27.1 if you want. 
All right, that is, that is it. Go ahead and do your section review, and then we'll wrap up the semester. Welcome back, guys. Let's take a look at our last section review. On the last three sets of chapters we just looked at, so again, this is a combination of a variety of different questions from all three chapters. So we begin with extraterritorial rights. And the extraterritorial rights were those rights granted to British citizens to be subject only to British, not Chinese law. When in China. So extraterritorial rights. Sphere of influence. Sphere of influence was a region in which economic interests of a foreign nation came before those of the home country. Uh, instead of making a political geographical boundary like they did in Africa, you make a sphere of influence which mainly controls the economic benefit from a specific region. Uh, so that's what a sphere of influence was. The British and other countries had their spheres of influence within China, and that's where they could maintain their, their economic dominance over that Chinese region. Intervention was that term that the United States used. Really what it means is interference or kind of meddling with affairs in different countries. In this case, with the American intervention in Central and South America, yeah, there was some interference, there was some meddling, there was some, you know, swindling going on uh, to the benefit of the Americas, right? Then we were looking at the Opium War to identify the Opium Wars. Well, the Opium, opium Wars were wars the Chinese fought against the British to stop the opium trade. There were two of them, and the Chinese lost, lost greatly. And the Open Door Policy was proposed later on, also dealing with China, which protected American trade rights in China and protected China from that threat of colonization. You know, that it was on the brink of happening, what happened in Africa. Who knows, Henry Stanley goes to China and plants a flag for Belgium and then suddenly you've got the scramble for Africa happening in China again. But the open door policy kind of saves the day. It gives a much more lenient economic approach to different countries to be able to trade. If everybody has, a, has the ability to trade, then it kind of reduces, simmers down that competition. Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry was a Commodore a sailor. Uh, he uh, was the American guy who, with his steamships, comes in, makes a huge statement with the American industrial technology and opens Japan to foreign trade. Okay. They make Japan sink pretty low, and then Japan learns very quickly becomes a global uh, power very shortly. Industrial power, too. Panama is the site of the Panama Canal. It is a country in Central America. Uh, I don't actually, it might, be the, it might be the site of the narrowest point between the Atlantic and Pacific. And so it made sense to cut a channel through there. You got, again, if you get a chance to watch documentaries, check out the Panama Canal, the construction of the Panama Canal. Lots to learn with that historical event. They had originally hoped to build it a sea level, so to basically dredge and cut right through. Uh, but that would just have meant so much material to move that they eventually went to a lock system, dammed up a thing, made a lake. Go check it out on Google Earth sometime. It's pretty cool. Um, our questions. Why did the British import opium to China? Well, opium was that one thing that the Chinese would buy. You could actually trade with the Chinese for uh, opium. Now, what did the Chinese do in response to that? Well, they started those opium wars. They didn't like it. You even have their imperial majesties uh, corresponding between China and Britain, trying to get the empathy of, of Britain about this horrendous thing going on, the sale of opium in China. All the opium wars are lost by the Chinese, and what did the British gain from that treaty of Nanking, which ended the opium war? Well, British gained the right to trade at Chinese ports, at several ports, control over Hong Kong, and full payment of damages from those wars, which, by the way, I imagine would be not too cheap for Britain to fight across the world. 
to fight the opium wars and Chinese had to pay for both sides of the war. That, that harbors tons of resentment. And by the way, the Chinese have tons of resentment. And you know what they did after World War I? They made the Je uh, Germans pay damages. And guess what? That resulted in tons of resentment later in World War II. So it's interesting how history does repeat itself in elements. I hope you're beginning to see patterns. The more you study history, maybe the more patterns you begin to sort of see and question. Okay, number two. What changes took place in Japan during the Meiji era? Well, that's the point in time where industrialization and modernization was set as very important. So what do they do? They abolish feudalism. They adopt a constitution like Germany's. First railroad lines built. Coal production increases. Okay, They pump out factories, uh, get a modern army, modern navy, and become a global power. Uh, how did Ju Japan become an imperialist nation? Well, they also become an empire, an imperial power in the world. Why? Because they go and invade Korea and uh, get the Korean Peninsula and northern China, Manchuria. Uh, to the surprise of everyone, they even kind of, they even turn back Russia. Russia is a global power and Japan, this wee tiny little new kid on the street, they able to take out Russia? Yeah. Yeah, they are. That's why they're pretty impressive. Number four, how does the United States gain the right to build a canal in Panama? Here's that interference we're talking about, that intervention an example. Well, they encourage Panama, the Panamanians in that part to revolt against Colombia. And then they say that, then they go to the Pan, uh, people of Panama and they say, we'll lease this land from you after the Panamanians, I think that's what you say, the Panamanians gained their independence, so to speak. So they make the Panamanians turn against the Colombians. Why? Because Colombia was going to charge too much. So let's get that territory to another country. How about Panama? Okay. Well, good job meddling, United States. Colombia is still a disastrous place to try to live. Number five. Why were industrialized nations interested in the Pacific Islands? And with this, we wrap it up, guys. Resources. The strategic value as a naval bases, and amazing exotic getaway spots like Hawaii. Wouldn't that be nice to have a Hawaii? That's it. So that wraps up our. That wraps up our unit. That wraps up our semester, guys. Uh, for the most part, I think what will happen at this point is once you get to this point, then uh, feel free to write that quiz the last quiz of the semester, and that kind of gives us ability to end and complete History 10. My words are, thank you for tuning in. I'm glad you stuck in and uh, stuck it through with us. I hope that you found uh, that looking at things like the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, uh, nationalism and imperialism, that we're setting up your viewpoint and your understanding of how our modern world is the way it is, why it is the way it is. And of course, setting you up for those immediate instances of understanding your historical context in history 20 next year. So amazing, amazing. I can't say that I'm the greatest at bringing history to life, but I really think that uh, these are some really kind of neat, uh, neat, neat things to explore the bigger picture concepts. And I hope that, that, uh, that you, uh, come across history that fascinates you and that you continue to see the value and importance of history. And also note that, you know, every, every breath we breathe, every day we live on this planet, interact with other human beings, you know, really is history in the making. It might be not, you know, huge major history, but it might then be, and we just, you know, it's hard to say, um, unless you are in the future looking back on us. And we are the past to somebody else who can see that bigger picture that we just can't see. All right. Anyways, uh, I'll leave those thoughts with you. Uh, until then, don't be lame. As always, take care.